Uh, we are currently calling this initiative uh, Alia Yakta. Uh, and now that the die has been cast, classics jokes my students should now get, uh, we're planning to create a schedule of events and talks around tables and maybe even more ambitious happenings uh, going forward, all based around the academic intersection of ancient history, uh, video games, and digital media. And so our topic for today is ancient history and video games a roundtable discussion. We're going to discuss tools, methods, classroom strategies, which bring these topics together in sort of a foundations and approaches conversation, which should be interesting and productive for our scholars and for students, many of whom are in the audience now. So I'd like to get started with our introduction for our speakers. Uh, Dunstan Lowe, Dr. Dunstan Lowe is a senior lecturer in Latin literature at the University of Kent in the UK and works in Augustan poetry, as well as the classical reception of video games and modern media. Uh, in 2009, he edited the volume Classics for All, Reworking Antiquity in Mass Cultural Media, uh, and more recently has published the chapter Transcending History and the World, Ancient Greece and Rome in Versus Fighting Video Games, in the volume Return to the Interactive Past, so Greece versus Rome uh, with punches and kicks. Uh, Kate Minetti, is a graduate student in classics and archaeology at the University of British Columbia, who works on connections between Greek and Egyptian culture and antiquity, including Egyptian objects which made their way to southern Italy. Uh, she also works on the reception of ancient Egypt in pop culture and video games, including uh, how video games represent Egyptian gods, monsters, and curses in polygonal form. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah McCall, received his PhD in ancient history from Ohio State University in 2000 and as a teacher at Cincinnati Country Day School. He has published extensively on video games and pedagogy, including the book Gaming the Past, Using Video Games to Teach Secondary History in 2011, and more recently worked on Video Games as Participatory Public History and Digital Legionaries, Video Game Simulations of the Face of Battle in the Roman Republic. Uh, Dr. Aris Palatopoulos is a lecturer in archaeology of the ancient Near East at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. He is one of the founders of the Value Foundation, which is well represented here, uh, which works at the crossroads of gaming and academic study, which has numerous interactive projects, including uh, an exhibition, which I'm not sure if it's still there, uh, titled Culture Arcade at the Prince Klaus Fund Gallery in Amsterdam, or another project which recreates ancient Roman spaces in Minecraft. Uh, he's recently published on virtual ziggurats, orientalist views, and playful spaces. Uh, Dr. Angus Maul is another co-founder of the Value Foundation and assistant professor at the University of Leiden Center for Digital Humanities. He is a scholar of digital history, and his work focuses on combining digital tools with approaches to material culture and social history. Uh, together with Dr. Palatopoulos, who is a co-editor of the 2017 volume, The Interactive Past, Archaeology, Heritage, and Video Games. Uh, so a great thanks and welcome to our international group of scholars who have graciously made time for this conversation today uh, to discuss this important and uh, fascinating subject. So a few sort of ground rules. Uh, we're going to have about 60 minutes uh, for a discussion of some questions which have been pre-circulated, some general questions on it. Uh, ancient history and video games. And then at the end, we will have, uh, after an hour of discussion, 30 minutes uh, devoted to uh, questions from the audience. So keep those in mind, prepare those, because you'll have a chance to ask our team of scholars about them. I will mention, although you've probably already gotten the news, that this session will be being recorded. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, please sure to mute yourselves when not directly speaking. Okay, so now I'm going to pass the rostrum over to my colleagues at the Center for Critical Play here at Cal State Long Beach, uh, Dr. Sean Smith and Jeff Lawler, our moderators for this morning, so just they can talk about their mission statement and get our conversation rolling. Okay, I, we can do it together. Um, yeah, we're I, very good at talking yeah. over each other. This is what we do. Um, so, <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Lawler, and that's Sean Smith. Uh, we're <laughs> directors of um, uh, the Center for the History of Video Games and Critical Play at Long Beach State, and we have a uh, playable archive there. So if you're ever in town and COVID isn't 
hitting us, you can come and play all sorts of, of games and do research. And um, we also have several classes there. Um, our students uh, in, our, in our history and games classes um, know this. We, I, we, we also have a, a, a web page and blog at criticalplay.org. Beyond that, we'd really like to get to our speakers today. That's why we're here to talk about ancient history in video games. And the first question I think we, we always get to and talk about, which was, which was on a rostrum is, and, and we'll leave this wide open. We'll see who wants to attack this first. Um, and particularly for uh, may, maybe many of our students who haven't taken one of our classes or a games class is, why should historians care about video games? It's a big question, but. Don't make me pick someone. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna start on that just because I can't take it anymore. Wait a minute, split second, I think. Um, so there, there's several answers one could give. I think um, when we were looking at video games, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we felt very much that we had to look at the number of sales to sort of justify why historians should look at video games. And I forget at what point the games industry surpassed the, the movie industry um, um, as far as sales, but it has. So uh, one answer is that um, many, 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 many people build uh, or play games and it's, and it's a serious sort of uh, uh, cultural artifact. Um, I think, the part that interests me the most a, 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 as a, uh, an answer, and I'll, I'll leave my colleagues with this, is that um, it doesn't, there seems to be a growing number of us practicing history who don't think that history needs to just be limited to the academic text. That in fact, doing history is something that is it, humans all share and video games are in their own way a form of history just as much as any other um, uh, kind of artifact. So I think those are some reasons to study it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, no. I'm, I'm going to, oh, yeah, if you want to go, absolutely. No, no, let's go, go alphabetically. You go first. Ah, yes. Very good. Very good. Very good. Well, that means my first name then, I guess. <laughs> All right. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, fu fully agree. Although I will have to say that <clears throat> often when I, when I use the, the it's very popular, so we should care uh, argument, um, I often get a bit of pushback from that, from, from academically minded colleagues in particular. Uh, simply the fact that something is popular it doesn't necessarily make it interesting um, for, for historians, for academic study, right? It could definitely be an interesting way of doing history. So uh, what has always fascinated me about video games is is how they're actual actually able to give us experiences of the past and i mean it in a quite literal way right this this idea of of a playful time machine and uh, absolutely this time machine is constructed out of parts of the present in the sense of that we are making that past in our current moment right and and that simple paradox in itself it's about the past but it's made in the present it allows us to experience the past that is made by the present just makes it to me a very interesting subject of study let, let alone sort of the absolutely right argument to make that since so many millions of maybe even billions of people <laughs> a billion of people are, are 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 consuming video games and are probably primarily consuming the past through video games uh, we should we should take an interest but even that taken apart. I think it's an absolutely an interesting uh, paradox to study. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all saying um, very similar things here. Um, there's the there's the nature of games, um, which is that they offer a kind of interactive experience. And um, in particular, video games are um, immersive visually and even um, increasingly um, spatially. So they they let you engage with the past um, or feel like you're engaging with the past at least um, in new ways. So that's why games in particular are interesting um, as a research tool as well as a, a teaching tool. Um, and then the other thing, which I think is what um, Jeremiah uh, pointed out very uh, right off the bat is that um, just in sheer numbers, but also in, in the way that people think games are embedded in our culture. We're increasingly a, um, you know, a gamified culture and, um, it's every decade that's increasingly true it will continue to be true for decades to come um and of course the definition of what is a game is going to change but not to get too visionary um i think we should just focus on the fact that nowadays people play all the time and um and uh, digital games are usually what they're playing 
So um, being aware of that um, shows you not only new ways of engaging with the past, but also um, it shows you how people think they have engaged with the past. And so these are quite powerful and scary um, tools. These, um, some of the, especially the, the most popular uh, historical video games, um, they're doing things, they're shaping our view of history um, in the bigger picture in ways that need to be understood. Um, it, because they can be good and they can also be bad. So <laughs> it's not just that games um, misrepresent the past because every, every uh, representation of the past is going to be less than perfect. Uh, but there are things about games that, that might trick the mind into thinking that they are more um, uh, reliable simulations, that you really are in a time machine in a different way than when you go to the movies or when you pick up a book. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're, it's a double-edged sword. It's very powerful, and it's we're we're kind of living, you know, in in a, a gamified society. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think there's two directions there: what games what games are for us, and um, yeah, okay. Um, and I'm petering out into into nonsense now. <laughs> oh, Basically, there's, there's what I also... said was right, and I'm agreeing with it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything. Like, I'm really grateful that, like, someone mentioned that, like, these games represent how we, like, let's go meta. These games also show us how we, or, like, the producers and programmers perceive the past. So this is, like, a medium that is culturally and politically and whatever you have it filtered through, you know, how many filters. Um, and so I think there is something to be said about using these games as a, a, an experiment in, like, critical thinking for students when we use them like in the class to teach them that what they see as a representation of the past is not actually a representation of the past. It's someone's idea of the past according to these, 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 and these categories. Um, but yeah. what games are popular are also, I think, an indication of what we like to see in the past. Uh, because if a game is not popular, then clearly there is something that is not working about the way it is presenting the past, either as you know, a visual perspective or a gameplay perspective. So I think there are multiple uh, allow me the pun layers, haha, archaeology um, to the to the question, and multiple layers to the answers, and multiple ways in which we can use. And also, as an archaeologist, these games are a gateway drug into the study of antiquity. For many of us, that's how I started. Um, I was, a young, I was young uh, and I started playing Age of Empires and I was dragged in. I was literally like sucked into antiquity and the past and everything else. So as, uh, you know, as uh, uh, scholars of antiquity and teachers and educators and everything, we should be aware of the fact that many people want to study the past because they see these games. So we should also be aware um, of that. Yeah, and just to, to go full circle here, I, I also want to stress this point uh, quite a bit, the fact that there is a history or histories being produced in a popular sphere that we often as historians or archaeologists imp impressively tend to lag behind. You would think that the, the, the academy and the academics are the ones who are at the forefront of developing the, th the thought around history and how we think about the past and shape the new ideas. But in fact, a lot of these ideas are being shaped every single day in a lot of digital environments. And it is, it is mostly us who are lagging behind these, these ideas that people have. And then you get a lot of students or even just your friends at the bar having all sorts of ideas or opinions that, you, that might surprise you because they might be exceptionally nuanced or they can be blatantly wrong. But either way, we are the ones that can potentially lag behind um, and that I think is another reason that we should take this very seriously because it's significantly different from what has come before, from the popular history and uh, historical literature and historical movies and whatnot. It had an impact, but games seem to have an even even bigger and and more actual impact, if I can say that. So I think that's one more reason to to try and stay afloat of the developments that happen outside of academia about history and archaeology. Yeah, exactly. And also circling back to what Jeremiah said in, the, in his opening statement, this idea of 
games and working with games allowing us to go beyond the academic text. This is, I think, an, a supreme example of where academia is lagging behind so far to the realities uh, of everyone, right? <laughs> um, well, not everyone, but especially everyone within, uh, you know, within people that uh, fr frequent digital spheres, right? Um, and games, or even opening it up a bit wider, the idea of playing, right, opens up all sorts of new media forms, new experiences of knowledge sharing, knowledge making, or, or indeed, uh, uh, you know, critiquing knowledge. That it's uh, that's absolutely something that is also a reason why historians should care about games. I was just going to add a philosophical point. I, I, this seems like a smart thought, but it may not take us anywhere. It is interesting to me as ancient historians, we spend most of our time dealing with secondary sources that are hundreds of years later by people that have frameworks that may not be the same as ours. Um, and, and that's what a video game ultimately is. If, if, if you can use Plutarch as a source, then you can probably use a video game seriously as a whole source if you have if you have a methodology about how you might go about it. It's just thought. Yeah, I fully agree, right? It's it's um and it, it seems just saying that using video games as a secondary source seems very strange. And I think one of the other aspects of seriously engaging with video games is also understanding that we have a deep cultural history ourselves mm. of of having this very ambivalent uh, relation to fun, to play, to games, right? And well, you know, if you really sit and think things through, I absolutely agree with your statement, right? There could be very much more considered uh, viewpoints, opinions, etc., in some games than in Plutarch, for example, uh, and therefore it could be a more interesting source, even as, as a secondary source. Uh, but intuitively, or uh, not, not necessarily intuitively, it's but but uh, culturally speaking, it's almost like wait a minute, let's let's not do that because we're serious academics, right? I think we can. I think that's a nice segue in some ways to our, our next question when we're, we're thinking about sources and we're thinking about how video games or developers um, create games, you know, and, and whether how, how or whether that's a, a form of history, how we consume that history. Then it, 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 to the second question is, um, you know, how have games then represented ancient history in video games and in particular, I know a, a lot of you have, and, and Sean and I particularly look at this in, in some ways is, you know, the stories that are included or excluded and what that says about how we think about the past or how the developers want people to know about the past, which is always an important thing, particularly when, when I'm playing a video game or thinking, having my students think about they're playing that video game, that the missing parts or, or why something is in, included. And that goes with any historical text. But as many of you mentioned with a game, like that immersive nature, right? Um, creates a, 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 another layer, if you will. Uh, I'll, I can pick that up to at least begin. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go after. I think, yeah. That, there are many answers to this question. The one big answer is that the way that, that, that games have represented ancient history is very similar to at least the, excuse me for this, because the, the building is, uh, is letting me know that I should, I should put my sign downstairs. Oh, I hope they're not going to kick me out. We'll see about that. Maybe I get kicked out of the building and then I can't, uh, I can't join. Um, so, but just to say this then, uh, in many ways, games have represented the histories that we know already from movies, from other forms of, of popular media, because, because they began and they, they still are popular media, they were also influenced by what influences other popular media. So if one would follow the trajectory of the representation of the past over time, they could potentially identify a lot of similar trends as we see in movies and classical Athens, for example, in ancient Greece being very prominent, ancient Egypt being very prominent, all these, um, all these topics that fascinate at least the Western popular audience. Um, but of course, this has changed as the trends have changed in a way. Um, more histories are being represented and even blockbuster games start to include more and, and different kinds of histories. 
but still there is quite a bit of a Western perspective to it. And still there is quite a bit of yeah, top-down view of the past and, and very linear representations of the past. The, as we've already said, video games are very powerful tools for doing a lot of things and for, for telling different kinds of histories, um, but also not. So games, again, like Assassin's Creed or like Civilization, all these big blockbuster games tend to do the same thing over and over and not really straying away or, or reinventing themselves or reinventing the medium, um, but they tend to stick the several known tropes that already define our perception about the past. If you look a layer below, where there are the independent developers and where there are the more creative people, not saying that there are not creative people in the AAA industry, but you get what I mean. There you start seeing the diversity. There you get you, you start seeing that there are there's a breadth of ideas about the past. There's a breadth of cultures that can be represented, a breadth of identities that is being represented as we speak, and more people can play and associate with these kind of games. But one has to dig just a little bit deeper to find this. But that also shows the potential. So there is a problem, yes, and there is also the potential and the solution in a way. And there are reasons as to why we're not headed necessarily towards a solution, but we can talk about this down the line a bit. And I will check if they can kick me out of the building or not, and I will be back in, in three minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, Kate. Good luck. <laughs> can I jump in? Uh so I'm glad that um, Aris mentioned that it's a very uh, top-down approach because uh, there are like three points that I would like to make with this question. Uh, one is that most games, and I'm talking of you know, AAA games, big games, focus mostly on an elite perspective. You are the ruler. You are this disembodied ruler who, who decides what to build, where to build, or you are like a powerful warrior who's still upper class. You're never going to play like a Peltas. You're never going to play like a poor peasant who's being conscripted and thrown into the battlefield. Are you only ever played or like mostly ever played as like, you know, a chivalrous nobleman or a hoplite or anything else. So someone who's like really in the upper class. Um, and then there's the, you know, the other uh, byproduct of that, which is elite war, mostly a male perspective. Um, until I was the tender age of 32 years old, there was not a AAA game in which I could play with my gender, right? Until Cassandra from Assassin's Creed came out, there were no women. And like we've always existed, but somehow games that show ancient history are mostly giving us this war elite based male perspective. And I like I know that um, like um, indie games and other things are more focused on other aspects of antiquity. Uh, and I need to cite the excellent Julie Levy, who mentioned also that there are so many more aspects to antiquity than just war. And yet many, many, many games set in antiquity only focus about the warlike aspect. So like in antiquity, you were, you could only be a rich male who fought all the time. Like where's, you know, yes, I mean, if you're lucky, you can, you know, oversee some agriculture, but that's not what you see in most games. That's not the past that many people think about when they see it through the filter of video games and also a lot Western centric. Like if we see other cultures and I'm not, I mean, I have to bring Egypt into this, we see the exotic part of it, right? So there's still this Orientalist flair to many representations of, ancient, of the ancient world. Um, it is getting better, but I think that the, the, the kind of history that we see represented in big AAA titles is basically the kind of history that fifth century Athenians were writing, right? It's about males, it's about rich people, uh, not necessarily white because whiteness, whatever, it's our concept and not theirs. And it's, you know, that is that is the elephant in the room that I think many uh, big production uh, um, uh, companies are trying to address right now. Also because of pushback, if you make games that are not these things, then there is a pushback from a certain side, you know, of the audience, especially white male gamers who don't want to play with poor people, they don't want to play with women, they don't want to play with people who are not white in their mind. So I think we should be very aware that the way in which the past is represented is strongly influenced by these things. And I don't think it's the developer's fault to, you know, to a point, but I think we should be very aware of the kind of past we are looking at. 
Um, and I'm not trying to stir, you know, to stir up the pot, but it had to be said. So now I'll stop, I'll stop rambling. And if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, can I leap in? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, amazingly um, stimulating range of uh, comments made there. And it's, it's a bit hard to, um, to latch on to just one or two, but um, I was very interested in the, um, the observation that um, there's video games have, have, labored under a limited um uh, and you said elite um uh point of view and and i suppose you could say uh elite white male uh privileged point of view and so on um and it is an interesting parallel with ancient sources because in order to uh express yourself through um source materials um and and to to do things uh, economically that leave a mark on history you have to have some kind of a some kind of privilege um and of course i I think everybody would welcome the um, increasing diversity of experiences available to people entering into history in video games and, and playing as uh, a person in the past. Um, and yes, it, it took an incredible amount of time for uh, a, a playable female um, historical individual to, to, uh, to come about. That's a bit of a, an embarrassment, I think, for the games industry. Um, it's partly about um, the maturity of the medium, because um it has um in its early days it was not just a um a, a children's um activity to play games but it was specifically an adolescent one it was um the first game cabinets were in were in bars and it was for um you know it was recreational just the way that air hockey or pinball were, were recreational for a, an adolescent largely male um audience um but on the other hand, there are certain reasons why we can't see a full representation of historical experience in games, because games require agency, they have to be fun, uh, you have to be able to do stuff, and therefore, in order to, to, to die in infancy or to uh, die at the age of 45 after a, a year, a, you know, many years of hard labour, having never travelled more than half a mile, um, would be very historically authentic, but it would be very difficult to make that um, sell. Um, because we're really looking for uh, the type of experience that people want um, when they dream of the past. So they want to they want to feel the full potential of of immersing themselves in the past, rather than falling into like uh, you know like in Quantum Leap into a random person who might not <laughs> might not have I, very I, much power. <laughs> um, I should hope there's a happy medium between uh, dining childbirth simulator in ancient Egypt and you know just <laughs> play, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just to make another point, uh, very as briefly as I can. I know I'm rambling here. In response to the idea, uh, the question of um, how how games have represented ancient history, of course they have to schematize them, and um, and uh, as you just said um, at the beginning, the, uh, strategy games are a very common way to represent um, historical um, settings, which is all about combat and about wars and sometimes great men all of the things that people used to think history was all about. Um, but there's also, um, uh, sorry, I'm slightly distracted there. there are, um, okay. Um, I don't know if you can hear voices in the background yeah, here. There's people playing, that's, that's fine, that's fine. There's yeah. people just running around and playing, having fun. <laughs> yeah. that, that happens, um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, I was, yeah. um, I was just going to mention the sch schematic. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I just want to mention one of the very earliest historical games, Hammurabi. Um, it's, it's sometimes pointed out this is like a proto game, um, and that's interesting because you are you're Hammurabi, you're the most important man in his world. Um, but on the other hand, it's not about combat; it's about economics. You're supposed to feed your people and make them prosper. And um, it's interesting to see that there, in a way, it's a taste of things to come. You're the lord of your world, the god, and um, and you're running things, and it's all very simple. Um, but on the other hand. It's not about combat. It doesn't have to be about combat, even if it is very schematic. Um, and some games aren't at all schematic. And the opposite of the strategy game is the maybe the text adventure, where you go from one point to another, and it's all about narrative. Um, anyway, I'm going to I'm going to stop there and um, mute myself because it's somebody else's turn. Um, yeah, yeah. What wonderful comments being made. I think what I'm particularly enjoying here is you can see that we've been around the block a couple of times when it comes to history and video games because you know if you answer the question how have games represented ancient history up to this point um 
most most discussions that you could also have about this with just random people in class or on the street is also inaccurately right so uh, that is that is a very much um uh, a big point of debate often when we when we discuss these in, in, in this setting but in a way as we're already doing we're stepping over that inaccuracy debate right a accurate or not because in a way it's not the, not the most interesting one right it is very much about uh, what, what games do um, how they do it and particularly i absolutely love this, the second part of this question what stories have been excluded or neglected but one of the other things that I'm clearly picking up on in this discussion as well. It's not only about stories, it's also very much about mechanics, right? It's the, so what mechanics of what, what you could say, what past practices have been neglected. He, he, for so, some for obvious reasons, as such as dying in childbirth, I don't think would make, well, I'm sure that there would be some sort of boutique horror game maker that could make an, a quote unquote excellent game out of this. <laughs> Dunstan is like, I want to try may, may, or, or play it. Right, but but uh, there's a lot of practices, right? Uh, and in that sense, I'm really curious to uh, particularly explore the, the upcoming um, AC Assassin's Creed Valhalla uh, Discovery Tour because one of the things that the previous Discovery Tours have lacked uh, is very much these verbs, right? These, these interactivities. It's you're, you're wandering through it as if it is a diorama, while on the other hand, the verbs that you play in the regular Assassin's Creed are all about killing and, well, actually, they're all about killing. It's just in the game. And the promise here now is that, in fact, we will get to do more things in these in this absolutely beautifully reconstructed world. So I'm very, very excited to try that one out. I wonder if Jeremiah could speak to the notion of kind of problem space within um game as a way of kind of maybe combating some of the representational um, aspects in, in games? Yeah, I mean, or... yeah, I, was, I was kind of thinking about that and, and it's an interesting question, right? These, these motives get kind of murky and to what extent are, for example, to what extent are Western design games colonial because we're, we're, we're colonialist in our assumptions even when we're not making games that way. There's been some nice writing on that um, and, and I guess all I, and I, I was sort of thinking um, there is something, though I agree you don't want to get reductive about the types of experiences you might mention. I think there is something to the fact that if you're going to play a game, games create what I call a historical problem space. And they're going to, and, and we can debate about definitions of a game, but please let's not do that here. Uh, um, but, but, but generally speaking, right, we've got an agent and we've got an agent with user design goals, or excuse me, with um, designer goals um, um, set out for them. And so there's going to be something, I think it was Dunstan who said it, there's going to be something about agency. There's going to be something where you have this central character and the central character, at least the way the commercial business seems to approach it, has to have some compelling story. I completely think that there's lots and lots of compelling stories out there that are not being told, but I think that the medium does, the medium does tend towards the epic, towards the power fantasy side. And I, and, and I think that it's probably just a need of more diversity in design teams to find the creative and the epic in the mundane. I mean, there's lots of things that are, you know, uh, living every day is an act of courage in a scary world. So there's lots of things that um, um, can be sort of aggrandized, but I think it's gonna focus on a powerful within their environment person. The other thing I'd say is that I think games have a tendency to treat everybody else that's in that space as an instrument. Um, that we look at things from the perspective of the agent and the agent with the goals set out for them says, you're either helping me or you're hindering me. So it actually, if you're not careful, promotes a really horrific way of looking at everybody else in the world who doesn't happen to be the uh, agent itself. Um, and I think those are, I don't know that those have to come with games, but up to this point, I think those are biases that have absolutely been in games, um, whether by design or inclination, I'm, I'm not you know, sure. I wanted to highlight briefly the fact that what we're discussing is also very much linked to what Angus said uh, earlier, that games are very much about the now as well, because a lot of the, the problems we're discussing, a lot of the, the evolution in quotes of games and, and stories that happen within games are not necessarily, I would say, but in a way it is also part of the maturity of the, of the industry. It is also, they also tend to reflect societal changes. 
So, for example, LGBTQ visibility has increased over the last years. And because we are seeing such a big component of the Western population being gamers, they also have, have moved that issue and demanded this kind of inclusion in games. So societal change and changes in, in popular culture go relatively hand in hand. Often popular culture can shape social changes as well or societal changes. Um, and that is that is part, I would say part of the reason it points to the to the power of the of the player and, and what the, because we talk about design and how, how the developers design the games and what kind of paths they they put in their games. But in a way, it's also about the player and what paths the players want to see in their games. And the fact that players want to see more inclusive paths makes for better games, at least in my opinion. And there are clearly people who don't think that. And the Battlefield example is, is a prime one. And uh, Angus can talk a bit more about it if he, if he wants, because he studied it more closely. Um, but I think this is a big component to it. That is, what kind of histories people actually want to play. And in that regard, I think it also goes to show that the epic stories do still sell quite a bit because Assassin's Creed is always an epic story. Civilization is always an epic story. And all these grand narrative games have these big stories. But again, if, if, you, if you look among the, the more creative solutions to game problems, you have games like This War of Mine, where you get to play you know, a civilian in a, in, a, in a besieged city. And this is definitely not a very epic story. It's a, it's a story about hardship and struggle and extremely difficult decisions, but it's definitely not epic in the same way that we understand it. So I think this, this is there. So the, the stories that we haven't seen, the stories that have been excluded or neglected, um, will also be gradually reflected in games if this is something that can happen in, in, a, in a meta level, in the societal level, but also the other way around. So it's, uh, it's, it's again very much about the now, but also as we as historians change our reading of the past. And yeah, we have been telling the stories of great men because this is the kind of history that was produced in the, in the 20th century. But now we do tell stories of other kind of, of the other even on quotes as it was recognized in the past, right? So historians also produce, produce new kind of histories. And I think from our perspective and the fact that we are here and talking about it, it shows that there is also a responsibility to make sure that these stories make it outside and make it to the games. Um, and it's also the stories that have been neglected or excluded it can happen because we haven't ourselves extended the helping hand to the to the game developers and say, hey, actually, there are all these stories that we, that you can tell, and they are pretty awesome. They don't have to be epic, but they are pretty awesome, and they can make for very nice games. As, as a tiny, tiny, I'll make a short mark because I'm sure that you also want to go on to other points of discussion. But also as a as a as a reaction to what Jeremiah was saying. Uh, what is baked into the medium, of course, of video games is, is very much part of historical contingencies as well. And we, as historians and people that study the past, we know that starting dynamics can be absolutely instrumental for, the for further developments. So the fact that we play strategy games, 4X games, in which we always play some sort of leader, some sort of king, is absolutely contingent on the fact that a Sid Meier himself had been playing Empire and had been playing other games in which he played powerful men sits at, you know, being a king is fun. We're going to be playing a king in civilization. And we have been playing kings ever since, right? And um, it's very important to understand that it's, it's, it will be hard as to, to break through starting dynamics, right? But it's definitely possible, as we can see, especially as I has already highlighted, in, in the indie space, it's, it's happening there. Let me just add to that, because I was I was thinking that before you started saying that, Angus, I mean, shout outs to the developers who are not doing ancient history games who have been really finding different voices. Uh, I'm, in my interactive history class, we're going to be looking at when rivers were trails, um, right, which is the Native American perspective of being uh, uh, dislocated. Uh, we've got through the darkest of times, right, with the resistance of the Nazis. So these stories are out there. I, I think I wonder if in ancient history we're under a double or triple burden because both we've got the mythological aspect that draws people in that tends to get 
epic. Um, and we also have a hard time documenting what's going on with with people that didn't make it into the main narratives. Um, but yeah, they're definitely a guide for the sorts of things that maybe we could be doing too. I think that's a good transition point there. And maybe just to bounce back to Jeremiah, um, since we're there is, is the next question has to do, um, I won't read it, but it has to do with pedagogy in the, right, the classroom. So how can games be used in, in what different forms? I know Sean and I teach about games. We play games in classroom. We have students create games, different kinds of game board games, basic HTML games. Um, where do you think, or how do you think that is best introduced and used in the classroom, particularly from uh, ancient history perspective? So I, I was, my, my, my real introduction to public history as a concept was when I was asked to write that, that article on, on participatory public history. And as somebody who came in, you know, as many people do coming in with a PhD, I wanted to teach the professional discipline of history um, and really focus on what it is that historians do. And here you go, 22 years later of teaching, I'm much more interested in the impulse that makes us all want to kind of study the past and not necessarily in, in formal ways. For me, it's the debate. For, for, for me, the central point is take this game like you might take any model and read some or talk about some independent sources of evidence and then critique. Um, I, I, want, I want my students to be doing this when they're looking at a speech. I want my students to be doing this when they're looking at something I've written. And so for me, I think the role games play is several fold. One, I think this popular medium that can be critiqued is a really important thing. Game designers are incredibly talented and intelligent people, and they come in with interesting perceptions. And so it's, it's something we should think about. So that idea of sort of looking at a modern medium and trying to get behind it, I think, I think educational contexts are really good for that because you really can start to challenge a game in the way that you might not challenge a historian's work or something like that. It's a nice introduction to uh, media criticism. Um, but the other thing I think is that uh, what video games do most of all, and I, I have not perfected this in my classes, but, I, but I'm striving for it. What video games do most of all is they put a player in an agency position within systems. Um, and so looking at issues of historical agency, uh, which are really important, looking at issues of historical empathy, um, trying to understand the systems that limit us or don't limit us that works, work so importantly with those contingencies, I think those are really important things as well. So, uh, you know, summing it up, I would say criticize, for heaven's sakes, argue about whether the games are, are you know, to what extent they're accurate or not, however you define that. And think about what kind of choices do the players get to make? And are those consistent with choices that people in the ancient world got to, uh, got to make? That's a, I think that's a rich area for conversation. So that's how I would start. Um, yeah, that sounds fantastic. I, um, I think that uh, Jeremiah, as usual, has, um, has made all of the, um, the key theoretical points um, when it comes to the pedagogy of video games. Um, just a couple of practical matters that sprang to mind with the question of how games can best be used in, in, in the classroom. Um, the benefit is, of course, that play is motivating. So it makes you care about the subject and critiquing it is part of, can be part of the, part of the game. Um, but basically it, it motivates people to, um, well, to interact, but also to research and to, to understand um, the game, perhaps for an advantage at the time, or perhaps because they, you know, lights a fire they can take away with them. Um, the, and then there's some, some obvious practical uh, risks as well in, in using um, digital games in the classroom. Um, there's the risk of accidentally pandering to the students and giving them what they, what they want uh, just as fun rather than, uh, rather than educating them. Um, and of, of course, the responsible teacher would never allow that to happen. But um, of course, you've got, to be, you've got to be aware that they use games to avoid learning sometimes. So uh, it, they must realize that it's actually a way to learn. Um, and then there's um, there's the technical problems, the expense, um, the problem that stuff is going to go out of date really quick. So you can't keep using the same game for 10 years. Um, and um, 
but there's one um, perhaps less obvious point that, that sprang to mind, which is that we think of gaming as a way of involving young minds and switching them on because they're kind of digital natives. Um, but maybe gaming is sometimes can exclude people because there are some people that don't like them and, and giving them that filter uh, is perhaps, um, is perhaps demotivating. So I guess games as an enriching option um, are, are um, probably going to be very popular. Uh, so long as we don't kind of, as long as we don't kind of um, adopt them uh, too readily and, and not realize that actually they work quite well with traditional methods and for some traditional methods are better. I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure about access in terms of um, like particular individuals learning styles and learning needs. Um, that I don't have any experience with it, um, but I'm just wondering whether anybody has any views on that, whether gaming is is good for accessibility in terms of, you know, um, particular individual requirements, like if a person is dyslexic or has some other you know, visual impairment or something, can games be a good supplement that way or or do they just raise more problems than they than they solve i don't know it's getting very practical now sorry we're, we're, we're talking about the ideas let's <laughs> <laughs> go no, that down to the practical level sorry <laughs> no i think i think that the practical points you make here are, are very important uh, in the sense of that um sometimes people in fact don't like games or, or even if they they do like them they find that academia is not um the context for it right that they just find it inappropriate this has happened uh, quite often not not people that will go to that specific course about games that you're teaching um but but definitely if you sort of randomly introduce a game uh, into the into, i mean if it's a kahoot or whatever they're, they're fine but uh, you know if it's an actual game you're asking them to play then things can get uh, can get scary quite literally for them in terms of what am I doing here. Um, also, I, I don't agree with the fact that if students are having fun, then we you miss the mark. I'm, I'm not sure if that was meant completely in irony or not, but uh, <laughs> because in, in a way, in a way, right? So um, um, uh, it's it's my it's my personal belief. It's not something I can sort of say. Oh, I've done extensive research in this. That uh, if fun is leading in a game, I think that's that's absolutely important. So you can do all the edutainment you want, but if it's primarily education rather than fun, then it's not going to stick as a game, uh, un unless it's you know particularly good edutainment that is mostly that is maybe has a very good balance between fun and um, and uh, and edu and learning. So I think that's very important to get right. So you don't just want to find the most educational game that you can and just plunk it into your into your classroom setting, right? I think you want to find um, a game that is both fun and is also reflective of the learning aims that you've got for your students. Uh, and uh, and run and run with that um, as a final or maybe as a segue we can also get back to practical matters or this is also a practical matter I guess one of the things the games are also very good at uh, because they're magic circles right they sort of suspend the, the here and now and in that sense they work as a as a, as a as a time machine quote unquote but they also work to suspend the hierarchical relations of the here and now. So if you have games, you can also very easily let the students lead, right? Those normal hierarchical relations that you have between professor and, and student uh, or teacher and pupil, you can let the students lead a bit. Oftentimes they know more about the game <laughs> that you're playing than, than you do, or otherwise they have other you know, tacit knowledge or very explicit knowledge about this medium that, that sort of allows them to, to quite literally take the lead. And that's, of course, a very wonderful experience when that happens uh, in a classroom, at least I think so. Someone in, uh, um, in the chat mentioned that games are insanely good for easily visualizing history when it's done correctly. And I think like, personally, as a very visual learner, I think that's like the most, like the best part of, um, of being able to using games, but not just games, but also like 3D renderings and everything because you are kind of immersed in the thing. Like, I mean, through the screen, or like we're not using VR, uh, VR sets yet. Uh, but I think that like going back to Dunstan's um, question about accessibility and other things, I think we can take like a step even further back and like um, many people cannot, like many students cannot afford to get the games, right? So when we're talking about, oh, using games in class, we also need to think about like the social dynamics of the class and like the problem that we're, basically talking about people who can afford, you know, a computer, a gaming laptop or a console or a controller or anything or a good internet connection that is needed to download many of these things. So I think that sometimes when 
you know, when as, as educators, we, we think about, oh, I can use this game, and everything else. We're just, you know, making the step longer than, than the leg, as we say in Italian. It's just, we're, you know, we're thinking as, as if everyone had the same access to everything, uh, which sometimes it's, I mean, most of the time it's not, it's not true, especially if you're, you know, teaching uh, remotely and long distance. So I think that's also a thing to, to keep in mind. Just to add to, to reverse that point a bit as well, um, because I, I agree with, with a lot of the things being said, and particularly the, the fact that not all students are gamers. And because I've, I've taught in, in, in classes of 100 students, and then you introduce a game and, and half of them go, eh? <laughs> because they, they simply don't know. Um, and of course, that's fine. Not everybody has to be a gamer. But another risk is exactly the opposite, that the educator is the one who, who doesn't know the games. So being able to teach history or archaeology with games requires a threshold of expertise with, with games that A, not all educators have, and B, even if they do have it, maybe they don't have the time to keep it up to date. Because I've been teaching, for example, with World of Warcraft for several years and talking about World of Warcraft and cities and whatnot. And at some point in, in my classes, World of Warcraft became so irrelevant because nobody plays World of Warcraft anymore, right? And the thing that I was playing and, and spent 300 days in, nobody, nobody was getting it. And I had to figure out a new way and find games that are actually relevant now, play them, and play another bunch of games. And I'm saying it as if it's torture because it wasn't. But I had to figure out like other games. I had to go through other games and make sure that the, I can make the points I want or I can have the students play them and get out of it what I wanted them to get out of it or discuss about. Um, so I would say in terms of accessibility, it's also a high threshold of accessibility for educators if they want to do it well, because you otherwise you end up being this teacher that makes a movie reference that's from the 70s, because that's when that movie was relevant in, in relation to that topic. And then nobody knows the movie because it's from the 70s. Um, you even run this issue nowadays with Star Wars, right? A lot of people simply... Yeah, or the 90s, increasingly. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> but but that, that, that is actually a thing. Like, you talk about stuff from the 90s, and you, you have students who were born in 2002. So that, that makes perfect sense, that they have no, no reason to know that, that piece of medium. So you need to be up to date. So you don't, not only need to be up to date for for your academic component and the stuff that you teach in your class, and you're not teaching stuff from the 90s, but also if you want to play and if you want to have your students play and learn from playing, you have to not have games from the 90s, unless there's something hyper-specific. But in the analogy, and if you want to use games as analogies, you, you kind of have to be up to date. Um, I just wanted to go back to a point because there were some great points being raised. Um, you know, I, I uh, at some point, I think, right, if in gaming the past, I, I think I had a header saying why fun isn't a good argument for using games. And it's and and, and as a number of you have pointed out, um, absolutely, we cannot, you know, generalize and say that students of a certain age are going to play games. Um, and if they do play the games, they may not be the ones that we're actually um, assigning. I think for me, um, and, and, I, and I also think uh, the comments, um, Kate, you were making about, about accessibility to uh, different machines and things like that, absolutely, these are really important points. I think the point I want to kind of press a little bit more is that, is that those are realities, um, but, but, I still, but I also think there's a reality that games offer an ability to talk about things easily that you might not otherwise get to, otherwise get to talk about. Um, um, and so what I've tried to do, going back to the whether you feel comfortable as a gamer or not, I try. I don't use that phrase. I don't, I don't ask people who identify as that. But I guess for me, I'm trying to find the things that games can do that it doesn't matter whether you find the medium compelling or, or not. It, it becomes compelling through its use. So again, critiquing these models of choice, looking at agency, um, understanding how systems work. Uh, games throw a lot of stuff at you like that at once and get you thinking about your choices. And I, and I think that's, it's not that you can't do that with other media, of course you can, but it's particularly well suited to those kinds of questions. 
think that's a good transition to probably what will probably be our last kind of a topic of conversation before we head into a kind of Q&A section. And I want to bring it back to the ancient history part of things and maybe away from the pedagogy, um, not because I'm not interested in practical pedagogy that I could sit in here for the next hour and a half and just talk to you all about how to do this. Um, but mostly because I think for the students in the audience, I think they're more interested in maybe how um, game, how these games are um, or how these games represent that ancient history. And I'm wondering kind of more about the, the specific challenges or the concerns that we have about these representations and how students read the ancient world in, in, um, in playing these games and how this might be maybe a little bit different than other types of history um, and, and the way that other types of history are approached in, in video games. And I'll open it up to whoever wants to. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm happy to start, but I'll take it a little bit laterally in the sense of that my my background is not um, in the study of uh, antiquity, um, but it is definitely in the study of prehistory, uh, prehistoric Caribbean archaeology, to be very precise. Um, and I think one of the things that um, is absolutely the case there is that I think the presence of, of text of written history absolutely shapes uh, the games that are made about it it absolutely also shapes the engagement that people have with it right so one of the things for example you can see in the otherwise very in impressive and excellent Assassin's Creed um, you, you'll see that when it comes to the Caribbean my regional specialty you'll see a lot of license being taken particularly with the prehistoric period of that uh, that region simply because there are not so many texts there there's not it's, not it's not so well known and the colonial period on the other hand is you know very well represented um, and but at the same time the flip side of that is it also it, it that gives especially when you're making games with students or when you're um, or when I'm sure that also developers will also feel this, you're also not you're also not bound to the text as much. So often when 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 we're using Twites, for example, in class, a very nice game making engine, um, I get the question of does the game that I make does it have to you know represent has it to does it have to be accurate? Does it have to follow the history as it actually happened? And of course, that's the nice thing about prehistory and and antiquity in that sense is that you know. There's archaeology, sure, but there's not that that one single authoritarian, uh, well, not authoritarian, uh, author, <laughs> uh, that uh, maybe also authoritarian author, but uh, that is uh, sort of leading leading the history as we know it. For me, one issue with with ancient history that might not necessarily be reflected in in more recent uh, types of history, although I, it can potentially be shared across all periods and regions, I guess. But one of the things that I've observed is that, especially when it comes to the what we perceive as ancient, there is a big sense of purity of the past. So when a game needs to be made about ancient Greece, for example, ancient Greece is either the classical period or Alexander the Great or a twisted combination of both. So, and there is the history of ancient Greece might span 5,000 years, but if you tell somebody ancient Greece, they will only understand this. Um, and in, in some other cases, for example, with the Persians, you will only get the Achaemenid period. And the Achaemenid period, compared to the entire history of Persia, is a, is a, is a tiny fraction. I mean, it's relevant for us because Persian Wars and ancient Greece. And again, it conflicts with the other pure, the, the, the Greeks. Um, so we never get to play games about the Sassanids or uh, about the Parthians, maybe they are included in, in you know, Europa Universalis or, or in Imperator Rome or whatever. They are there, sure, but they don't get their own dedicated games. Um, and I think that's one of the real issues that w the, the further back you go, but not too far, because then, then it's fair game. In prehistory, it's a bit like anything goes, but when you're contained into what is perceived as the classical past, it becomes about purity and it becomes about the ideal of the ancient Greece, the ideal of Rome, the ideal of the Achaemenids. Um, and in more recent histories, you have more chances to tell multivocal histories, particularly if we're talking 20th century history or 19th century history, because we have more texts and we haven't idealized our recent past 
yet, or at least not to a really big extent. But with the ancient history, it's different. And that's one of my problems as well. We don't see the different. And I have a personal beef. I'm, I, I specialize in the archaeology of Assyria. And I think it's really awesome. But you never get to play with the Assyrians and this, this giant empire, right? And it, it's a big question as to why. Why is it so different to play with Alexander the Great or the, or the Achaemenids, but not to play with the Hittites, not to play, and I'm talking about the Near East because this is my area of expertise, but the same can be argued about the empires of China. Why not get to play Imperial China? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that, that, that is one of my issues with ancient history and games, the, the sense of purity, which extends to other media as well. And it's, a big, it's, a, it's a big discussion, the purity of the past, but I think it, it games it's exem exemplified really. Hmm. Um, I just want to respond to that because it's a really good point. And um, this idea of purity, I think, just means reinforcing stereotypes. And when we were talking about the maturing of the medium earlier, I thought, well, it has matured in some way, but it's um, the the analog with the analogy with uh, with cinema um, is is not just economic. Um, it's also the the breadth of the, the number of different um, kind of uh genre ecosystems that you get in games um so increasingly we get the triple a titles which is the hollywood and then we get indie games which are much more interesting and diverse and uh we get certain genre games you know you want to see a western you want to see a um i don't know um uh an action movie with cars um there are certain things you're going to see and um in the same way um people gamers are looking for games like the ones that they know um, and, and this is a consequence of the economic growth of the, of the genre. Um, if you compare it with something like, I don't know, graphic novels or tabletop gaming, um, the ecosystem is different. It's, it's a smaller economy, but it's a lot more varied and the production, uh, process is quicker and, um, pretty much anybody can make a graphic novel if they want, if they really try and they have a little bit of cash, but not everybody can make a, a virtual world. Um, so to some extent, what you get with, um, with video games is, is that you know people people um, are making things that follow in the footsteps of success, and so in in a broader cultural sense, we do that with cultural stereotyping. You know, um, you want the greatest hits of ancient Greece, and that means uh, not the deep cuts. <laughs> you want to you want to have the ones that were in the movie soundtracks. You want to have like the big single that was at the charts of the charts for ten years. Um, it's it's not going to be as as varied unless you're a really hardcore fan, um, <laughs> um, as, as we might hope. And um, I was thinking about historians versus non-historians in, in preparing for this discussion. And then pretty soon I took that idea out and thought there's no such thing as a non-historian. <laughs> it's just different kinds. Um, but um, there are specialists. There are qualified, trained specialists, and they are the biggest nerds and they want the deepest cuts. And, um, and unfortunately, most people only want to see um, Vesuvius and, you know, the Parthenon. And that's unfortunately where we are. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it could be changed, um, but it's maybe better to see the, the games kind of, like I said, uh, market as, as broadening and, and kind of fragmenting in a positive way so that there'll be something for everybody. And we'll see increasingly uh, specialist stuff that, 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 aligns more closely with the ideals of, it, of his, historiography and, and histor history as a discipline um, in, in its current state. Sorry, I kind of got off the point there a little bit, but... Um... Yeah, if I could pop in just for a second, I think what you said is, is very apt and sort of parallel to the process of being an educator. You know, the student may come in wanting the greatest hits and it's your job to give them that and then be like, oh, here is this side channel, here's this other information about architecture or about social life in Pompeii, then you have the big explosion or the big sort of splashy sort of single, as you put it, where you can use that as the way to sort of seduce their minds into like, here is different ways of doing history and thinking about the past. And um, I mean, I'm sure games can do the same as the sort of medium that we have, but obviously in different forms. Yeah, and, and I should have said earlier on, I don't see any difference between digital gaming and other forms of gaming. And um, a lot of educators have done uh, have created their own forms of play they've created tabletop games and rpgs and things and um that lets you um go back that, that lets you solve that um that kind of dilemma we were talking about earlier where you're trying to trying to uh, balance 
Um, and what were the two things you were balancing? Um, well, education and fun. Um, you can make a game that does just the, just the right recipe that you want. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, I, I don't, I don't, I no longer think that digital gamings are qualitatively that different, so far as education goes, um, um, from one another. Um, yeah, but then again, what you see in in games today, um, it does vary a lot by by the medium. Um, so that doesn't hold for everything. I, I think um, we do want to get to, to questions. I know students and others have been posting it. And I, I, but on one point, I think with all this discussion, it's been great so far is, um, and, and often how Sean and I think when we're thinking of games in the classroom, and I think several of you referenced this in some ways that, you know, these, these are t the games in the sense are texts um, and giving our students tools to read those texts is really important because then they may understand, you know, how history is being infused and why it's being infused. And then they can be maybe not critics, but, you know, be analytical about uh, portions of the game, right? And so these are just other sources we can give tools for our students to read, particularly if these sources are often infused with purity or infused with certain representations. Um, I like that idea of, of purity. I, I think of that, I teach the American West and, and games like RDR2 are like this, this mythological purity of the, the West. Um, but I think there's a lot of comments here. Um, you think we can open it up to questions, Sean? I think, think it's probably about that time unless anybody wants to have kind of last word. Um, the chat just all of a sudden started to explode. Um, and I'm really sad that Kate, you only get to carry a trowel and you don't get to go um, kind of drake on us and blow up ancient historical sites. Um, <laughs> oh, so I'm very sad. I had the explosive in the other room, but unfortunately. <laughs> right. uh, we had a conversation yesterday in my games class about Nathan Drake and uh, Laura Croft kind of just blowing up ancient world heritage sites um, so that they can find the right piece of the puzzle to progress the narrative forward. Um, uh, and I'm really sad to know that you guys don't do that. Um, right. uh, <laughs> preservation, what is that? Um, so looking at the at the chat, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, before we get into the kind of the chat questions here, um, I wanna open it up and um, I'm happy to either take uh, questions in the chat that we can read to our guest panelists, um, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and or raise your hand and then unmute yourself. Um, I don't want to open it up to everybody just shouting. Uh, um, uh, we're happy to to engage like with a real person instead of text chat. Um, but first of all, Nathan Drake is a looter. He explodes things. We all hate him. Uh, Lara <laughs> Croft. Lara Croft has a degree. I think she has a PhD in archaeology or some sort of humanities. So let's get this out of the way. It's Dr. Lara Croft. She still uh, blows sorry. things yeah. up, but with a doctorate. So. <laughs> <laughs> so at least there was a semblance of trying to make her somewhat academically, uh, you know, she's qualified to blow things up. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, all of archaeology is destructive by its nature, right? So that is very is, in true. Fact, not so much of a qualitative difference between between. That is very levels. true. It's I'm just, going to uh, try. Know, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to bring my, up... Michael Bay archaeology rather than actual archaeology. It's both destructive. Yeah. Yeah, when we when we get to uh, Zack Snyder archaeology, then we can get you know the aliens coming down. Anyways, um, I'll try next time I'm on the field. I'll bring some uh, some explosive and see what my field director thinks about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna start. I think um, just kind of looking at the chat, flipping back through it, it looks like David Herrero had a question. David, do you want to ask that question, or do you want me to? Uh, I guess I'll ask it out. Okay. Um, by the way, I was I was really intrigued by all the, the discussions you guys are having. It's really, really interesting. Um, uh, my question is like, uh, what do you all think about the rise in popularity of like simulation games? Um, I can't recall the specific one, but it was like kind of putting in this first person perspective as like a frontiersman and like the main goal was simply to just build a home. Like even though they, this kind of these type of games kind of fill a niche genre in gaming, but it's but it's still the fact that it's still present and um, there are people playing, willing to play these games. Do these games kind of redefine our understanding of play? 
And like, what are the limitations in attempting to present history in a bottom up perspective such as this? I do understand, like, especially ancient historians, it's really hard to like get a lot of bottom up, especially since a lot of texts are either completely gone or people didn't know how to write. But what do you guys think about this kind of rising sim uh, first person simulation perspective? It's, There's a name for this genre of game, isn't there? What's it called? Um, I forget. I mean, there's been some really high-profile examples. Survival um, game, you mean, survival. maybe? Survival, yeah. but some kind of survival. Survival, like a uh, survival simulation, I guess. But the ones uh, where you yeah. like permadeath and. I guess an example, a, a good example, I guess sometimes would just be like uh, maybe like truck driver simulator, where it's like you're simply just doing something, okay. like <laughs> acting like that, where. Uh, simple action such as this, but I believe there was a specific game where it's like it's like a frontiersman. You're basically just building a home and establishing home in the frontier. So even though this, there is no sense of like a goal. There is a goal, but it's kind of simple. Like I was wondering, how do you guys feel like this kind of redefines the aspect of play and and kind of how it provides some a different sense of agency in the sense of playing. Yeah, it's a very good question, but I, I don't necessarily think it, it redefines the the actual aspect of play. I think it just um, questions how we have been discussing it so far in the sense of uh, there is fun to be had in being a frontier man, right? It's a, I think it's a great example of, of showing how there's lots of fun to be found in the past. And, um, and in fact, they're not so very niche at all, these games, if you think about it. For example, I mean, it's not exactly along the same lines that you're thinking about, but Valheim, it's absolutely not historically accurate, but at least it, it sort of was sold on the promise uh, that, you know, you were going to be a Viking uh, and you're going to be building this Viking village. And, you know, in a matter of weeks, there were 8 million people transported. The developers themselves made this joke that there were ne never been so many Vikings since the whatever, 8th century, right? 8 million people were playing the game. So I absolutely think that this is a, a great example of also how it, how we now think differently about fun, that it can be repetitive, that it can be uh, a, what we would normally call labor, right, work, and, and still give us uh, lots of uh, fun things to do, as well as insights. In fact, one of the things that I absolutely love about survival games is that you get at least a hint of an idea how how much work actually goes into making things, right? Uh, you already have this with, with Minecraft as a survival game, with how much work it takes to if you if you're in survival mode especially how much it works it takes to just make a building right even with one by one meter blocks uh, that's absolutely fascinating to me um another thing that those examples raise in my mind is um the difference in um in the aim of play uh, between having an end and and not having one you know a sandbox or or open ended and um, a lot of strategy games have that mode um where you're just building the biggest place that you can according to your taste and um and that is the end you know the game the the play is is the end um which is a, a weird offshoot of of the goal oriented style of play which has basically been every single game until yeah until that gradual kind of emer emergence of of modes um and then i i don't know what point they became actual games but yes there's a whole um there's a whole simulation type of experience. It cuts across genres, um, which, yeah, I, I think it is, in, in a mechanical sense, it's fundamentally different. Um, it's appealing to different desires in the gamer. Uh, but yes, as Angus said, doesn't it make a difference to your experience moment to moment and perhaps even not, not even in the marketing of the game. Um, but one of the, one of the compulsions of, of playing a game is, is, a, is achievement and collecting. You know, ticking off boxes and reaching a reaching a goal, um, and some games have a goal which is to to survive as long as you can. Um, I just realised I'm talking total nonsense. There's a very early game, Tetris, which has no end. Um, many other games, the the early days were just about getting high scores. So, right. yeah, I'm talking absolute nonsense. I just realised. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> open ended play has always been with us. Um, but I think you, the good point there also about it some games you're able to create your own narrative or at least immerse yourself in, a, in your own narrative construction right mm. and so the game then is is more self-oriented in some way even though you have the parameters of the original algorithm or what have you um, particularly in a sandbox game you you're you're constricted but you can still 
find new narratives or find something there. But it, yeah, it's an interesting point to the different forms of, of genre allowing for different immersive experiences. And then what do those immersive experiences bring to help people understand, in this case, the, the past, right? Or choose to understand the past. Um, we have, uh, I think, just uh, yeah. Emmett's had his hand up for a while. Yeah. So I kind of wanted to, Emmett, if you'd like to ask your question. And then we'll go to Brianna's question in the chat that I've highlighted. So go ahead, Emmett. And... Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for all this. This has been super cool. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that has, has really jumped out at me in this whole conversation, both watching the chat, hearing all of you speak, and then uh, reflecting back on my own interactions with game developers, be they video game or tabletop, is this idea that accuracy and fun are in some way two diametrically opposed things that you have to balance these two, that you, in order for something to be accurate, you have to sacrifice fun. <laughs> um, but that doesn't really seem to, that doesn't, that's not really true. I, I guess it kind of comes from the assumption that as historians, we often uh, approach games and sit there and wave our big sticks and be like, stop having fun. We're going to take away your toys. This isn't right. But you can absolutely have something that is accurate and, and, and fun at the same time. But uh, I guess we often assume that's not the case. And I was wondering what all of you think about that. Is, is, is this actually the case? Am I wrong? Or where maybe this came from? Or how is this shaping our, our dialogue, this kind of like uh, assumption that seems to be in place? Um, this is actually a question that we had in a panel on uh, archaeology and gaming. Um, I think last month, two months ago, there was a, a con about it. Um, and like the the answer is, oh, oh God, the answer is layered, uh, pun intended. So on the one hand, if we have something that is completely true to life, um, to archaeology, because that's that's what we we're talking about, that's my experience, uh, it would be pretty boring. Um, do you wanna do you wanna play SU Sheet Simulator? Go ahead, get it. But maybe you're gonna get like five people who enjoy that. Um, on the other hand, probably the specialists would like it. So um, I think on the one hand, there is to be like there has to be like a happy medium between something that is super accurate uh, but also enjoyable. And we need to make peace with the fact that some things are not enjoyable for the greater public. Like we need to make fact that most of the times archaeology is mind-bogglingly boring. Uh, what we do is fun for us. We get excited for, you know, pottery shirts and, oh my God, we found a tooth or everything else. But the, the great public, you know, the larger audience would not. Um, should that stop people from making those games? No. Uh, would those games make big AAA uh, titles? I also don't think so. And I think that's fine. I think that's perfect. Um, I would love to play a game that is like more, like more of a simulation of something that is true to life than not. Uh, but I'm not everyone. And I think that studios have to make choices between what would sell and what would people like. Uh, but that's like the field archaeology perspective, uh, archaeology's perspective. So I'd love for anyone else to jump in. I think it, it really depends on what you expect when, because I don't think it's by necessity at odds, fun and, and some kind of authenticity. Plenty of games have their selling point as being authenticity. So they actually sell because they say, we have something so real, you're going to have in it, you're going to have fun in it. So they're not necessarily at odds. It only depends on what is it exactly that, that you're looking for in terms of authenticity. So uh, we can make a generalized statement and say nothing is actually authentic because we simply don't know how it was and then anything goes. That's, that's, that's besides the point, of course. But it, when we're looking at Assassin's Creed, for example, and you're looking at Odyssey and you visit ancient Athens, it's, it's not 100% authentic because ancient Athens is a pretty big place and you can't possibly map this and have the player realistically go through it. But when it comes to the buildings, it's actually pretty good, I would say. The Parthenon and the Acropolis, perfect. It's the best, currently the best digital representation of the Acropolis is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I would argue, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a, a lot of fun to be in it and play with it and, and do all sorts of things. So it's, I don't think it's at odds. It really depends on what is it that you want and what is it that you want as a player. Because I'm going back again to the Battlefield example, but one of the things that 
that, that a lot of people said is it actually breaks our immersion to play with women in World War I because we don't think there were female combatants, which is both uh, hateful, but also untrue what they are saying. But they think it is actually not realistic. They think it's not authentic, and therefore they are having less fun with it. So it's a very, it, it goes back to what is it that you're asking from it. So there, there will be a level of authenticity because of authentic, there will be a sense of experiencing the past in a game. And then the degree of this experience can vary from an interpretation, a wild interpretation, or simply a setting, to something that's very detailed and, and carefully constructed. Um, but both of them are experiences of the past. And then it has to do with what you want to say with this experience of the past or what you want your players to experience in, in this setting. So it's not at, at odds per se. Wow. Um, these are a lot of fun and the chat is continuing to blow up um, and questions keep piling up. I'm going to ask Brianna's question. Um, uh, it was buried in the chat towards the beginning of this session and um, it, it, it plays on the same, the same kind of notion of, of fun and educational. And she asks, how do we decide which game is educational and which is not? Which are the, what are the rubrics? Uh, where, do, uh, where do we draw the line between potentially educational or purely entertainment and who gets to define it? Um, I think that's a big, <laughs> a really big question. Um, and my pithy answer would be I do because I'm teaching it. Um, so, right. <laughs> um, but I'll let you guys jump on that as well. Go ahead, Jeremiah. So um, I, I've, I've, come around on this a great deal. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky I get to be doing the second edition of Gaming the Past. And when I wrote the original one uh, 10 years ago, I tried very much to kind of argue for a more historical game, if you will. Um, and, 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 and I think that doesn't capture the reality. The, the answer, I, I, I believe the honest, authentic answer is in an educational game is one that people can learn in the process of playing and talking and, and, and thinking about. Um, we sometimes talk about educational games as if we can, I think I was tweet ranting on this the other day, we throw a game in front of somebody and it's educational, it means they can take away some learning for, uh, from it. And that's not really what the education process is in a field like history. The education process is a discussion, it's a debate, it's a, it's, it's a looking at evidence and, and sort of talking back and forth. Um, I. Uh, one of the people who responded in that tweet, and I, grand, uh, I agreed with him, you could take a potato and make it educational to talk about some aspect of history. Even if you were talking about like maps and countries, what it comes down to is, are you thinking about what is and what is not supported by evidence? And are you talking about that? Are you debriefing and reflecting on that? So any, I think any game can be educational. And I would be wary of a game that labeled itself as just being educational and say, that's really not the point. The point is the discourse about it. Uh, that's, I think, a, a fantastic answer, actually. Um, and I've got a couple more people on the list of questions. I think, Juan, you were up next. Uh, hey, um, oh. Sean, uh, Dwayne had his hand up. I think he put it down. Uh, I've, I've, I've put them in. I'm, okay. I'm putting them in order okay. as, I, as they're, as they're oh, popping Dwayne up. Is, so. Dwayne is gone. Dwayne is next it. after okay. uh, Juan. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to make a, a small comment related to the previous question between fun and, and accuracy. And the way the way I see it, I don't think that the pro it really depends, I believe, on what you mean by accuracy. Because I don't think that the problem is really about fun; it's about accessibility. And the, what comes to mind are, are the are the paradox games, right? I'm a medievalist, so the one that I'm most familiarized with is Crusader Kings. Crusader Kings is a very fun game, but it's a daunting game. It's difficult to learn how to play because the simulation tries to reproduce feudal relations to such a level of accuracy that makes it difficult to get into it. And very easily, one could imagine a scenario that if the game tried to be even more accurate, it would be too difficult to play and hence not fun. Hence, what I, what I think is really the, the, the balance realizing all simulation needs a level of, of, of abstraction and simplification just to make the game playable. Because if we were to reproduce uh, the Middle Ages 
to its full uh, accuracy one on one scale, we will not be able to play any game like that. And Crusader Kings is a good example. It is so focused on accuracy and feudalism that it needs to sacrifice, for example, the battlefield or all those social dynamics. That, that, that's just the comment that I wanted to share. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that comment. And I think we'll pass the mic over to Dwayne as well or now. Yes. Uh, uh, as historians, I was wondering, would you like to have um, a historian rating on certain games? Like accurate to straight nonsense on certain games. That way people would. Yeah, or, I think, you know, I, think I know what my next blog post is going to be, but it's just rated A are. for accent accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I'll let everybody else jump in, but there, you know, historians and other game studies people tease apart the difference between accuracy and authenticity, right? These do mean very different things. And I think in part what we're searching for is 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 authenticity, right? Uh, in in games, but that's a pretty big discussion. I'll leave it open. Yeah, exactly. It has already been pointed out in, in the chat. I think that there's we have to be a bit careful here with the with the terminology. Um, um, but uh, at the at the same, I think we all generally, I think especially, I think in the chat, we're definitely coalescing around the same the same band here. But it's very interesting the, the question that you just just raised, Dwayne. But in a way, it's already there. Uh, because if you look at, for example, at the Assassin's Creed games as probably a, a premier example of this, one part of the marketing is very much about which historians have said, this gets my thumb up and I have worked with this famous Viking, uh, Viking writing uh, author. Um, so it's very much already that sort of seal of approval, not in a rating sense. I don't think that would ever work, but uh, the it, we are already part of the marketing machines and the, and the branding machine of games, whether we like it or not. Uh, I think many of us even, in fact, have liked it when they're part of, uh, of games like that. So it, in a way, it's already there. Um, I think that someone in the chat, uh, Aidan, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, pointed out that the, the marketing of Assassin's Creed has been also like a source of discomfort and various issues because on the one hand they're marketing themselves as 100% historically accurate blah, blah blah on the other hand you have one uh vikings covered in leather instead of their famous fancy pants that they would wear um and two um sci-fi stuff you have the izu first civilization things so how do you write the some like in the comment in the chat was like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too but i think that those two things are like an issue of why there has been so much discourse about what is historically accurate and like is this you know um like is this like something that is a good simulation of what what history would have been is this something that they're just they're just you know uh trying to market themselves are exceedingly historically accurate but at the same time they have like like uh, the ones who came before who created hu the human race like where where do we trace this line and that's that's a that's been a big discourse in like in the assassin's creed fandom because many people feel like trying to make it too historical detracts from the origins haha of the game which is you know talking about this ancient civilization and on the other hand there are people who would want more historical realism and less uh, fewer sci-fi elements so that's also something to keep in mind if you're dealing with games that are not um, made to start with to be like historically accurate like I mean you can punch the Pope in the face in the face in Assassin's Creed 2 that's clearly not historically accurate but now the marketing is more like oh we have the historians on board we have things so there has to be you know a we need to trace some lines there and I, I don't know where they will be I like the first civilization stuff I like the historical tours I don't take them as like like a tool from which I can learn everything that there is to learn about the, you know, Vikings and Norse civilization. But there is, you know, there's that just to say that there is like some con contentious stuff there uh, and not just like when games market themselves as 100% historically accurate, mm, right? We are already in this marketing thing, but then how, you know, how much good faith is in that, uh, if that makes sense. All right, we are nearing out of time, but we have one more question. So if you all will be patient and maybe we'll give Alexander the last word here um, or the last question, I suppose. So have at it. Yeah, hi. Um, let me just say, first off, this, this has been absolutely fascinating and interesting. Um, my question is also about accuracy and because and we've kind of, this, this 
the discussion has kind of gravitated into that area. Um, and it's related to something that the Historical Game Studies Network has discussed in a roundtable talk as well a couple of months ago. For, for instance, can you tell historical truths in a medium where the text itself is different for everyone who plays it? Because I imagine like you would tell those truths with mechanics rather than with stories. But like you said, games mechanics are not necessarily not necessarily realistic, and more historical ones are often uh, excluded and so on. So how do you think truth, perhaps rather than accuracy, relates to what games are and, and can offer? Truth is a very it's it's a very difficult word to to use, I would say, in this particular setting, also because of contempt like the contemporary political conception of truth is very, yeah, is a, is a hot topic. So that that is one thing. So what we exactly mean with with truth versus, so it it, it would mean that there is only one unique version or experience of the past that that exists, and others are therefore invalid, which is not the case. Um, or at least in my opinion, it's not the case, and the past is non-linear, the past is particularly multivocal, and therefore there are different ways to experience it. And as a result, I would say it's an advantage of the games, contrary to books or to movies, that two different people will have a different, they will get a different text, they will get a different kind of experience, or they they will be given different things to, to play with. Um, that is one thing. So I think that is a strong point, actually. The interactivity and the non-linearity presents a better version of the past than a linear medium. Uh, and the other thing is that, again, it, depending on what we mean by, by the truth, if you get to play a, a particular character, uh, to express a particular identity in a game, that is also a version of truth. So the fact that you get to see what it would mean, for example, to be uh, a female individual in ancient Egypt. That, and and you, in a game, you can shape this experience and somebody gets to experience this, that is also a version of truth. So instead of truth as in the facts and truth as in the steps that, that have been taken, um, it's more about truth as in being able to get this view of the past as well. The, you, you, we have gotten and, and we have seen a bunch of like kings, experiences of kings, experiences of rulers and collapses and aliens as well and like all sorts of messy things, but you get to see all other perspectives and these are also versions of truths about the past. Not to get too postmodern about it, but it really is about the experiences in my opinion. Um, I just wanted to add in in there because um, I think some of the questions we've had uh, these last couple have been sort of again about accuracy and authenticity, um, and it makes a big difference whether you're talking about using a game in an educational context or not because you have to think about you know sort of different things there. But I guess where I find myself these days, the more I think about historical problem spaces and agency and things like that, is that a good question to ask. It doesn't. It, it wouldn't be like a rating scale necessarily, but a good question to ask is is the player agent set of choices a reasonable reflection of what they would have recognized as, as, as the choices available to them? Um, and so we still get into all these important issues about you know, whose reality is being represented and how people can look at it differently. But I think there's something to be said for uh, not privileging games that do that, but I think it's worth being aware when you're looking at a game and thinking about what games do put you in that choice making space in a way that's authentic and what games do, uh, don't and you can get in some important distinctions um then um so just thought yeah i just wanted to latch on still to what alexander was just saying when it comes to the mechanics and there being truth in mechanics i think that's a very important thing to to, to invest more energy and time in, 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 in this historical video game space right because um uh we're, 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 as academics, where text reigns supreme, we're often very much focused on, on the narrative or, or, or on, on analyzing these games as text. But I think analyzing these games as experiences driven by game verbs, by mechanics, is, is very important. And part of that, absolutely, I mean, 
I love talking about games we all love here, especially I've been enjoying the chat so much. Um, um, we all love talking about games here, but I think playing games and playing games together, I think especially, is something that is very valuable. Uh, um, as a very not, not that it will get us to the truth, Alexander, but it's definitely a very valuable thing. And in the, with that, I also want to make a shameless plug, because right now um, some of uh, of our students at Line University and are streaming the past project are, are playing a game on Twitch. So if you haven't had enough, and we we this happens almost every night of the of the week, at least Dutch nights of the week, so during your days uh, probably. But if you haven't had enough of talking about video games and playing them together, you can after this you should definitely head to streamingthepast.com or to twitch.tv slash value fnd and and chat some more with people from well, across the world really that uh, are very much into this uh, this sort of stuff all right i think we have and thank you and that's not a shameless plug uh we would have plugged it anyway yes. um so, so. <laughs> um, and encourage everybody to uh run off and watch um streaming the past it's it's a fantastic series I uh, encourage my students to go watch it all the time. So um, it means I don't have to do it, um, which is <laughs> somebody else is doing it for us. Um, so what, I want to take a moment to thank all of our guests um, today for what has been a really fantastic um, inaugural uh, uh, moment in this, this what hopefully, hopefully will be a, a long lasting lecture series. Um, so thank you for making this experience super fantastic. Um, thank you for coming out. And for those of you in Europe, thank you for staying up very late with us um, today. Uh, we really do um, appreciate that. Um, so that we'd like to give everybody a kind of a, a round of applause for, for their participation. I'd also like to thank all of you who came out and um, participated in this. This is this was a, um, a, a, a for us a very exciting um, set of numbers for the participants in, in this um, uh, in this conversation. So we really appreciate you you joining us for that as well, Jeff. You were. Uh, I would think we should also plug uh, Jeremiah's Game yeah. in the Past .net, uh, mm -hmm. a great blog with a, a lot of information and, and, and discussion and interviews and breaking down games. Um, I believe Dunstan, do you have um, do you have a, a site too? I think uh, or am I, maybe not. Uh, not at do. present. Can we plug Alexander okay. Vandavala's work? Okay. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to make sure everybody's getting because these are all you know good resources for thinking about games talking about games um and and like sean said we appreciate the attendance the the discussion board was great i'm glad kate moderated that mostly for us and <laughs> also <laughs> um so we we appreciate that very much yeah. um we're a little over time but if um i don't know if anybody wants to hang out for a few minutes we might just sit here yeah. Thank you all for attending. It's been a wonderful experience. So there was a good question, is there, where will this meeting be uploaded and available? Mm. For uh, we are going to put it on our YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> our YouTube channel through critical, critical play. Yeah, through criticalplay.org. Um, you'll be able to find it um, there. And I just knocked my microphone. Put it in the oh, chat. Yeah. Oh, geez. See, I, I, I am really bad at this whole, you know, self-promotion thing, um, criticalplay.org, oops. And then, you know, that okay. stupid autocorrect, critical This will play. give us a chance to update uh, our site. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> while you're, um, while you're typing is. away, I'd also yeah. like to thank you. And I think I also want to point out to students that I think if you will start to interact with these communities, uh, the historic, historical gaming community um, or the archaeo gaming community or any of these, you will find that they're in my opinion, very welcoming to a bunch of a bunch of backgrounds, diversities. And uh, I can only say, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, diving deeper, uh, come and come and play with us. Awesome. Thank you all again. Um, so we'll, we'll keep it open um, as people go. Uh, Jasmine, no, don't worry about that. I got, <laughs> I have a list of who was, uh, who was participating um, and who wasn't. So um, I know which of my students was here. So thank you all again. Thank you all for, for attending. So. Yeah. All right. Thank thanks you, guys. Thank you. Yep. Right. Kate. All right, and we'll send out another follow-up email as well. Um, 
to to you all to, to the participants. So okay. yeah, thanks, thanks, last thanks, minute thanks all for inviting me. Oh, for sure, right. absolutely. It was, it was fantastic. Coming. Thank you. We've had a great time. Yeah. All right. Great. I have to cut dinner. Yeah, yep. you should. <laughs> I think it's about time. Yeah. yeah, Angus, I have no beef with Assassin's Creed. I love Assassin's Creed. You can see that this is Valka's heart. So we, we, all, we, all have, we all have a beef with Assassin's Creed. We yeah. have. I mean, I only have beef with some parts of Assassin's Creed. Yeah, yeah I have plenty of beef. Fantastic. Plenty of, of uh, with Assassin's Creed. Yeah, yeah, but also plenty of respect for uh, the hard, yeah. absolutely yeah. hard work that these developers are doing. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Oh, sure. They've yeah. been doing, they've been doing like a, a, an excellent job so for some things, uh, for others yeah. not a lot. But, it's, you know. it's, it's 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 hard to be to be the best in your particular genre, right? Then you're that's actually very true. inviting a lot more criticism. So yeah. and that's, that's true. That's, that's what we are for, right? Yeah. <laughs> for the right, criticism. they're giving us work. <laughs> yeah. exactly. exactly. We should thank them. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. right. I support them by buying their games. So. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Uh, Bye, all everyone. right. Have a good night, guys. Right. Bye. <laughs>